Hello, BookTube. I once again have a pile of uh, new release, new items, new arrival type things. New books that will either be at your bookstore or that will be available to your library that, that might have flown under your radar that you might want to know about. I just, I, when I get a big batch of these things, whether I open them on camera or not, I like to show them to make sure you know they're out there. Uh, I've had it happen many times on this channel that I will either open or show you and talk about a book that ha that doesn't really do anything for me, only to hear from a bunch of you that it is exactly what you want. So I thought we'd go through uh, uh, just a pile of those, uh, just, uh, just for the fun of it. I don't think we've seen any of these on this channel. Uh, and the first one is uh, a David Murphy title. Uh, probably, literally, it's probably something I'll just send out to David Murphy in Lower Moose Jaw, wherever he's from. Uh, this is by David Banstein. And it's called There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths. No sheet on this one. The goal of economics is and must always be human flourishing. Utterly ridiculous. <laughs> this may not be immediately intuitive for those used to believing that economics can be found in mere formulas or antiquated textbooks. However, a movement is underfoot to reorient economic thinking around the human person. This reorientation will not merely greatly inform the modern debate on government spending, taxation, sound money, minimum wage laws, and so much more. It will further refresh our understanding of economics as the study of human action and provide the need reset of commitment to individual responsibility versus state paternalism as the organizing principle in society. Yeah, I think this is definitely going out to David Murphy. I don't have a, a sheet, so I don't have a date on it. Uh, but it has <laughs> it has blurbs on the back from Larry Kudlow and Ben Shapiro. <laughs> so uh, a really stupid evil person and a really smart evil person. I don't know what that says about the book. Or maybe I do. <laughs> then we'll move on. Let's just go straight away to somebody who maybe isn't blurbed by Larry Kudlow and Ben Shapiro. No, okay, you're not. Good. Good for you. Uh, again, no sheet, but I bet this is new. I bet this is recent. This is Breathing Lessons, A Doctor's Guide to Lung Health by Malin K. Han. Uh, a Doctor's Guide to Lung Health. It's going to be a little bit of a touchy subject for all of you tobacco addicts out there. Uh, especially the, the Instagram fitness influencers who will swear on a stack of Bibles and literally believe it because we live in the age of derangement that they aren't, in fact, Tobacco addicts. <laughs> they will literally swear that. That is what the the uh, the derangement of social media has done to us all in 2021. You pick your reality and it becomes real. Your vital signs won't move at all when you talk about how Donald Trump is still president. Okay, you mean metaphoric? No. No, I mean literally. He's literally still president. Okay, so you, you mean he's calling shots behind the scenes? No. Uh, no, I mean he shows up. He, he lives in the residence with Melania and he goes to the Oval Office and works all day long. Okay, it's it's factually, demonstrably true that that is not the case. We know where he is. We know what he's doing all day. No, no, not in my world, not in my reality. Uh, so, so those of you who are claiming not to be tobacco addicts, uh, just try to listen carefully here. Uh, every day, our lungs circulate eleven thousand liters of air. I wonder how much that is in American measurement leaders. I look French to you. <laughs> uh, provides us with life-sustaining oxygen and allows us to speak, sing, and smell. <laughs> I do a lot of smelling. I do a lot of singing, too. I sang a good chunk of... Uh, what did I sing in the shower this morning, Bean? Bye-bye, uh, uh, Birdie. I sang a good chunk of Bye-bye, Birdie. Pretty dumb score. You sing it without all the charismatic actors, and you realize how pretty dumb a lot of the lyrics are. But I did it anyway. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, it's no secret that our lungs are one of our most vital organs, yet most of us pay them little attention. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, has reminded us of the importance of our lungs and sparked interest in their function and the risks they face. In this book, leading pulmonologist and national spokesperson for the American Lung Association, Dr. May, May Lynn Melan Han uh, takes readers on a fascinating tour of this neglected yet crucial organ. 
Uh, Han explore, explains the wonder of breathing and reveals how the lungs serve as the body's first line of defense. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I don't think that. I'm no pulmonologist myself. I think it's it sort of goes without saying. It's almost axiomatic that your skin is your body's first line of defense. But maybe maybe this means internally. Um Han provides the wonder of, explains the wonder of breathing and reveals how the lung serves the body's first line of defense. She provides a timely overview of the latest scientific thinking about the leading respiratory risk, including indoor and outdoor pollution, smoking and vaping, wildfire smoke, and viruses like SARS-CoV-2, and offers practical advice on how to protect the lungs at each stage of our lives, beginning in the womb. Okay, well, a whole, uh, those of you, a lot of you will know medical people, a lot of you will know uh, medical and pre-medical students who might be fascinated about this, might be wanting to go on to become pulmonologists themselves, or if you just breathe, <laughs> you might be interested in this. I wanted you to know, I want you to know that all these things are out there. They're all over the map. There are, there are all kinds of different things in this pile. I just want you to know they're out there in case they're, they're uh, up your alley. Uh, so let's see what this next one is. Oh. Okay, very nice. Uh, nice uh, naked hardcover here. Very nice design. And this has a pub sheet, so this I can tell you. This comes out in November. $25 hardcover in November. This is by Kimberly Ridley, and it is Wild Design, Nature's Architects. With a, a lovely, uh, lovely finished thing, and this is all color all throughout. So you get, you get entries, and you also get tons and tons of color. And there is, there is the back. Very nice thing. Uh, what have we got here? Art and science beautifully intertwine in this book, which comes out in, in November for $25. By science writer and essayist Kimberly Ridley, a miniature cabinet of curiosities that, through lively essays and masterful vintage illustrations, explores the extraordinary structures and shapes found in nature. This book celebrates the stunning and functional forms created by animals, plants, and the mineral world, exploring structures as flamboyant as the elaborate seduction chambers of bowerbirds and as mysterious as the underground fungal networks that shape the grand designs of forests. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Uh, great. Uh, uh, flamboyant, elaborate seduction chambers. Deb used a seduction method like that on me and one of our uh, courtships. She used books, just piles and piles of books to lure me in. Uh, and it worked for oh, about 20 years. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, okay, this next one is a biography. And it, I don't know if this pub sheet is going to tell me. Uh, this is had, this is one of those, uh, one of those books. I'm thankful to report that the number of these books is lowering as time goes on. For a while there, though, book publication release dates were just chaos because of COVID-19. And this is one of those books that that's publication date has been changed. I don't know if this pub sheet, this pub sheet says November 9th. I don't know if that is still true. So, uh, you know, research accordingly. Uh, this is by Justine Picardi, and it is called Miss Dior, A Story of Courage and Couture. Uh, this work of biography and fashion history tells the story of Catherine Dior, sister of the great couturier, uh, Christian and namesake of the iconic perfume Miss Dior. Though she was a resistance fighter, concentration camp survivor, and instrumental to cementing the fashion house's legacy, Catherine's extraordinary life has gone largely unexamined. So those of you who know your Christian Dior, you'll know this figure, but now she gets her own book. Uh, in this book, the author lovingly restores Catherine to her rightful place among the heroes of World War II and in the history of the house bearing her family name. Twelve years younger than Christian, Catherine nevertheless shared a close bond with her brother, and they lived together in Paris and Provence at several points throughout their adulthood. Catherine was a constant gardener and cultivator of roses, whose scent proved to be one of the most indelible links between the siblings. When developing his first perfume, which was meant to define the spirit of Dior, Christian chose the rose as its heart and ultimately named it for his sister. The book centers on Catherine's experience in Nazi-occupied France, in which she fought for the resistance and was captured by the Gestapo in Paris in 1944. Though tortured, she did not give up the names of her compatriots. She was taken to Ravensbrück, the only concentration camp solely for women, 
and then, oh, good Lord, to a string of other horrible hell holes. She escaped from a death march as the war came to an end to reunite with her brother in Paris. Okay, so uh, the author, Justine Picardi, is the author of six books, including her a critically acclaimed memoir, If the Spirit Moves You. And she also wrote, I knew I knew this name, she also wrote Coco Chanel, The Legend and the Life, which I read, uh, and actually pitched, I, to the limited extent that I pitch anything, I actually wanted to write about her, her Coco Chanel book. Uh, okay, well, this list, November 9th, I... I have an advanced copy of this, but I think this is fascinating. So, uh, uh, in case you think the same thing, just be aware of the date. Uh, then we have, let's see here, uh, this is a smaller publisher. Uh, let's see, this has the sheet as well. This is by Bruce Glass, and it is the Anthropocene Epoch When Humans Changed the World. The Anthropocene being the, the current term for the, the age of the world in which we now live, in which uh, humans control everything and dictate the health and welfare of the, of the planet. Uh, as we hear more and more about climate change, pollution, and species extinction, some people may wonder how we got here. Some may wonder what all the fuss is really about. Some may even wonder if Donald Trump was correct when he declared that, quote, global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive, that it is nothing more than a hoax. Well, some people may wonder that, but if you take any kind of facts from Donald Trump, you're a fool. Plain and simple, you're a fool. And if you, if the, he's one of the most ignorant people on the planet. If you take your facts from him, you're a fool. But also, there's no doubt about this. There's no. Some people may wonder, but it's only because they don't know anything. It's only because they've stubbornly refused to inform themselves. This is not up for debate. This is not, this is not a debate. This, this is actually true. Uh, in this book, we will examine how humankind has altered the character of our home over the last 10,000 years. We will take a brief tour through the many ways in which we have dramatically improved our standard of living and made life much easier for most people around the world in just a few centuries, even in the last few decades. We will also examine how our growing numbers are putting a strain on the Earth's ecosystems. We will see how human development, consumption, and waste are putting unprecedented standard of living at risk. Okay, so do we have a date? Yeah, this comes out in early December, the Anthropocene Epoch. So if you, if you have like a shelf of books on the Anthropocene, there have been quite a few of them. Uh, you might want to add this one. You might want to think about it. Uh, and it's a small enough press. Uh, I don't know that we mentioned the press. Uh, it's small enough press so that I wanted you to know about it because it might not be in your bookstore. Yeah, this is DBG Publishing. I've never heard of them before. So this might not be distributed by Ingram or Baker and Taylor. So it might not be in your bookstore. Uh, but you might still want to know about it. Uh, then this next one has a very dramatic cover. <laughs> this is uh, Slaying Digital Dragons by Alex Packer. Uh, and this <coughs> uh, does not have a date. I do not have a pub date on this, but it's it, this is a finished copy. It's going to be a, a trade paperback for twenty five dollars. So uh, I imagine that it's the date is soon, or that it's come and gone already. Uh, let's see here. In this timely new book, award winning author and psychologist Alex Packer speaks directly to young people to offer frank, humorous, and necessary look at the effects of this excessive screen time on their lives, as well as to explain how big tech's algorithms are invading their privacy and hijacking their attention. The book mentions that during the pandemic, uh, the amount of time kids and teens spend on their devices and social media has reached shocking levels. Eight, 10, even 12 hours a day is no longer unusual. So that's unprecedented and epidemic. Uh, the book does not shy away from tough issues or preach top down. With empathy, respect, and lots of zany jokes, Oh my God, dad humor alert. Uh, Packer allows teens to understand the psychological and technological dynamics at play, empowering them to decide for themselves to take charge of their digital lives. For up and coming generations, this skill is as important as brushing teeth and using a seatbelt. I totally agree with that. That might seem hyperbolic, but I totally agree with that. Con understanding and controlling your interaction with the digital world has to be something you teach your kids. 
and one of the things that's going to be interesting about this book for a lot of people who read it is how much of this applies to adults. How in order to teach your kids how to better understand and interact with the digital world, you have to improve your own ways of understanding and interacting with the digital world. If you, in the last one week, the last seven days, going back seven days from when you watch this video, if in that time you have ever even once participated in the action known as doom scrolling, where you're on Instagram, not, not always Instagram, it's usually Facebook or Twitter. If you're on Facebook or Twitter and you're just scrolling endlessly downward, the reason it's called doom scrolling is because the thing you're feeling is worse and worse. You're feeling worse and worse. Every single thing you're scrolling makes you feel worse than the last thing, and yet you don't stop. You go on for an hour, two hours, three hours of doom scrolling. If in the last week you have ever done that, even once, then you also need to slay the digital dragon. It's not just you need to teach this to your kids. It's that you need to learn it yourself. Uh, so this, this book will assess, it'll teach readers to assess their digital health using quizzes, warning signs, and lively self-assessment challenges. See where it lies along the healthy-unhealthy continuum. It's a very easy test for that. A very, very simple test. Take your cell phone. Turn it off. Power, don't, don't switch it off. Power it down. Power it off. And put it on a table on the other side of the room. And see how long it takes before you are physically compelled. Not just mentally, not just, oh, I, feel like I, I, I feel like I'm missing out on stuff. I want to find out. But physically, where you literally find yourself across the room holding it in your hand without remembering that you made the decision to get up and go over there. See how long that takes. See how long, or, or if you don't want to do something that extreme, uh, leave your phone on, but don't look at it. How long can you go without looking at it? A minute? Ten minutes? The correct answer is forever. <laughs> if your answer is not forever, then uh, <laughs> that's a very easy test to assess whether or not you need to slay the digital dragon. Uh, okay, so the, the, the subtitle here is Tips and Tools for Protecting Your Body, Brain, Psyche, and Thumbs from the Digital Dark Side. So uh, I'm very, I'm very, it's very refreshing to hear that this thing promises not to be condescending. That's wonderful. I'm uh, not looking forward to the barrage of dad humor. <laughs> it's, uh, one of the things when when uh, when books when authors uh, promise, you know, I'm not going to top down lecture my younger readers. I'm going to talk to them straight on. Usually, what happens is just a double fold of condescension. <laughs> that is just, that that the young people who are the alleged target audience can pick out with lightning speed, lightning speed. If you are between the ages of 18 and 25, you have almost no sense organ more sharply attuned than your ability to pick out condescension. That's why it's so lethal. And that's why it works its way into pedagogy at all levels, including, I presume, parts of this book. It, there's nothing that will kill teaching quicker than if the people you're trying to teach feel like you're condescending to them. There's nothing that will kill it worse and faster. And this new generation, the the digital natives, the Gen Z, thanks to the fact that 90% of the, the interpersonal communication that they have is nonverbal, it's written, so in other words, really drastically limited in nuance, they have had to develop a hyper-awareness of things like condescension. Uh, so <laughs> I'm worried about that, but we'll see. The book probably has a lot of useful information. Uh then this next one is from W.W. W. Norton. This comes out in January. Uh, I don't have a sheet for it. Uh, but this is by uh, Adam Rutherford and Hannah Fry. And it's called The Complete Guide to Absolutely Everything, the abridged edition. <laughs> this, this is uh, unlike the rest of life on the planet, as far as we know. Humans have evolved with an insatiable desire to make sense of the world around us. Well, that isn't true, is it? <laughs> that isn't true. That might have been a good line in 1930. Uh, but it's 2021. Plenty of species have an insatiable desire to make sense of the world around them. Plenty of them do. In fact, it might be said that all of them do. Uh, the minute you determine that a honeybee has an extensive language, tons and tons of vocabulary, regional dialects, and the ability to invent new words and phrases then that's gone. Then all that concept is just gone. Then human isolationism, human exceptionalism is just gone. And honeybees do have those abilities. <laughs> so for Pete's sake, tiny little mollusks have those abilities. So uh, anyway, 
Our senses are not equipped to see the universe as it is, and routinely let us down in that quest. The world appears flat. The stars seem fixed in the heavens. That's why we invented math and science, the ultimate toolkit to explain how the real world works. And here we have adventures in math and science. Uh, in this book, mathematician Hannah Fry and geneticist Adam Rutherford investigate everyday mysteries. Does your dog love you? That's the one they chose. I mean, they investigate a lot of others, but that's the one they mentioned. <laughs> I, uh, I can say yes. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, alongside the burning questions of time, space, and the origins of the universe, what will the end of the world look like and when will it happen? What is time and where does it come from? Approaching these questions and more with science and math rigorous and playful, the authors celebrate the weirdness of the cosmos and reveal its secrets along the way. So this is January 2022, but you already know, if you're listening to this, you already know who in your life will want this book. <laughs> it might be you, but you already know. It's, it'll be a small, discreet subset. Uh, and then we have the, the next thing we have here is huge. Uh, and this comes out on December 7th of this year. It's a big picture book. It's still wrapped in plastic. Uh, but this is The Year That Changed Our World, a photographic history of the COVID-19 pandemic. From the folks at Thames and Hudson, there you have Empty Times Square. You have a uh, uh, hazmat scientist. Uh, this has 500 color illustrations, and it will be $60. Uh, from the earliest reports in 2020, to the vaccine breakthroughs of spring 2021, this book reveals through the pictures of Agence France Press, photographers around the world, the story of humankind's resilience, resourcefulness, and sense of purpose in the face of a global health crisis. In this remarkable time capsule, 500 full-color photographs document the deep human stories of the pandemic as it was experienced by people across the globe. Uh, so I think... I think it behooves us to uh, look at this thing, right? It behooves us to uh, to open this and take a look and see. Now, how how difficult are you going to make that, Thames and Hudson? <laughs> how, how difficult are you going to make that? It's usually very easy for me to break into packages because I don't have much of a sense of touch like the rest of you do, so I'm not, not constantly worried about uh, barking my shins or poking my fingers. Let's see what we have here. Oh, my. Home workouts. Look at all of that. There's a dog yoga. You all see dog. My dog does yoga. Look at that. Home workouts. You're stuck at home. Uh, so that's many pictures on the page. But then you also have individual pictures. There is Central Park with a raccoon strolling in the empty roads because there's nobody there. What a picture. What an amazing picture. <sighs> Incredible. Health workers. Uh, both cheering and being cheered. Great. Fantastic. All right. So this is $60. This comes out in two months and, uh, or a month thereabouts. Uh, it's a lot of money to ask for a book, but these are beautiful. It's, it's full of, fo of full color photos. And I've pointed out many times before, this is history that we're all living through. This didn't happen to somebody else, like so much else, right? If there's a gigantic oil spill in the Gulf or, uh, an earthquake in northern China. You might hear about it a lot on the news, but it didn't happen to you. This is history that happened to all of us. So I, 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 it'll be a keepsake for everybody. <laughs> but uh, this is this is a lovely, lovely job. Uh, wow. Okay. Oh, look at that. Heartbreak. Incredible. Okay, so the pictures are incredible. You lived through this. You might want to splurge on the sixty dollars and just have this as the, the you know the pictorial documentation of this history that we're all still living through. But twenty twenty especially, twenty twenty was the the Hiroshima year, and that that is some that means something that might be worth the extra money. Uh, so there you go. That is just a barrage of new releases. We have the year that changed our world uh, by Thames and Hudson. We have the complete guide to absolutely everything. <laughs> we have. Uh, slaying Digital Dragons, but uh, nominally about teaching kids to be wiser online, but you could learn a lot from it yourself, I'm betting. Uh, the Anthropocene Epoch, about uh, you know this current catastrophic era in which we live. Uh, Justine Picardi's biography of uh, Miss Dior, a hero of World War II, just unambiguously calls her a hero of World War II. That's fascinating. 
And then wild design, a whole bunch of weird forms in nature. Uh, design here in the sense of functional reality, not in the sense that the creator designed them, at least I hope. <laughs> uh, then breathing lessons. <clears throat> a leading pulmonologist writes about your lungs, your poor neglected lungs. Uh, and finally, there's no free lunch. 250 economic truths, uh, which I think will go out to Elk's Bladder uh, so that David Murphy can see it and maybe sneer about it. <laughs> so anyway, there are some new releases for you. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up before it gets much longer, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.